Okay, hello. We're going to try to do a lesson online to make up for the fact that our class was canceled on Monday. So where are we? We are dealing with capital gains. Okay. Some of this is going to be a little bit of review. Some of it is just going to be um, expanding on what we already know. First of all, when we look at capital gains, what do we have? Oops. We So far we know that income is generally taxable according to the progressive rates that we outlined at the very beginning of the course. You know, that is the default treatment that we have in the income tax code. So what we're doing with capital gains is actually deviating from the typical way that things are being done because it's an exception. We discuss that as a preference. The rates in 1H that deal with capital gains taxation, specifically for long-term capital gains, are supposed to be a break from the regular taxation with special rates. So what we're learning how to do, we've learned over the course, we've learned how to identify what is income, we've learned how to calculate income. Now with this part of the course, we're bringing it all home to learn how to tax this specific income. So, remember that you already know how to calculate the gain that's going to be connected to capital gains. We remember 61A3, 1001A, 1001B, 1011, 1012, 1014, 1015, 1016. We remember all of that stuff. So you can come up with the way in which you are going to be uh, calculating the gain. But once we figure all of that out, now the question we have is how do we tax that gain? As I said in the previous slide, the default is the progressive rates that are under Section 1A through, well, depends on how far you want to go, but basically E for our purposes. So, but that's not what we want to do. We want to figure out if capital gains actually applies to the specific type of income from property because that's the preference that we're going to focus on. So, what do we do? Well, let's figure out whether or not we can qualify for the preference. So, we've kind of focused on what we actually do when it comes to when it comes to calculating whether or not there is this preference. But let's talk about the analytical process. What is the first step that we're going to have to do? Well, in order to determine what our first step is, we actually have to work backwards here from Section 1H. You know, when we look at 1H, it talks about a taxpayer with a net capital gain being somebody who qualifies for 1H. So when we trace back net capital gain, we see that this takes us to Section 1222. And the net capital gain is defined as a net long-term capital gain minus a net short-term capital loss. And we have a variety of components that go into this particular definition. And the first level of definitions are in 122, 1 through 4. And these require the sale or exchange of a capital asset. So we need to know what a capital asset is in order for any of this to apply. And of course, a capital asset is defined in Section 1221 as property held by a taxpayer. Remember, we discussed this in class. It does not have to be with a trader business. This is not where the filter happens. Pretty much capital asset is defined very broadly. You know, there is no filtering here. The filtering comes later on whether or not you can use a capital loss, but not when it comes to classifying or defining a capital asset. So we look at 1221, property held by a taxpayer, which is a very general and very broad definition. And then it lists a bunch of specific exclusions such as inventory, stock and trade, et cetera, et cetera. The exclusions, the common theme as we discussed in class for these exclusions is they would generate business income, which is ordinary income and should be taxed accordingly. So the very first thing that we have to do, therefore, is determine whether or not there is a capital asset. Because if there is no capital asset, there is no net capital gain, and there is no special rate under 1H, and the default would apply, which is the ordinary progressive rate structure under 1A, etc.
So once you've determined that there is a capital asset and that is what the gain is from, you have to determine whether or not there is a net capital gain, which is what we kind of went through in the previous slide there. So the net capital gain defined in 1222.11, the net long-term capital gain minus net short-term capital loss. As I said in class, this does require each and every gain or loss from property to be identified as either a short-term or a long-term gain or loss, um, pursuant to 1222, one through four, the definitions there. So you would label every single gain or loss from a capital asset. And remember that the dividing line that we see in one through four is short-term is up to and including a year long-term is over a year. So basically imagine it as you're going around putting labels or post-it notes on every single asset coming up with this is a short-term gain, this is a short-term loss, this is a long-term gain, this is a long-term loss. So you label. And then once you start the labeling process, you remember that as part of the labeling process you have to test whether or not you can use specific losses. And of course, the specific losses we're concerned with here are the ones dealing with capital losses. So do you get to use a capital loss? We spent a fair bit of time talking about you don't get to have personal expenditures. Well, you also don't get to have losses that are on personal account. It has to be business slash profit seeking related. And how do we know that? Well, 165 limits losses that can be used to those that are either incurred in a trade or business, or specifically for our purposes, any transaction entered into for profit. As well, as we discussed in class, 165F limits these losses from capital gains to the extent permitted by sections 1211 and 1212. When we look at 1211, and again, we discussed this in class, 1211B limits capital losses to the extent of capital gains which is referred to as the capital gains offset rule. This means if there's, um, you can offset all of your losses to the extent of your gains, so they can cancel each other out. If you have more capital gain than you have capital loss, then all you've done is reduce the amount of capital gain that's subject to tax. If you have excess capital loss, then what do you do with it? If, if you've got more capital loss than you have capital gain, what on earth do you get to do with the remainder of the loss? Well, there is an additional rule called the ordinary income offset rule where you can deduct against your ordinary income the lower of either the remainder of the loss or $3,000. And again, it's the lower of. So example, if you had an additional $1,000 of loss after you've offset your capital gains against your capital losses, then of course you don't get to deduct $3,000 as a loss, you only get to deduct the thousand, okay? If you have any remaining loss after this additional ordinary income offset rule, so let's say you had an additional $4,000 of loss, well, you can take 3,000 of it against your ordinary income. I know we talked about silos and the fact that we don't want capital losses and capital gains to mix with ordinary income. This is the asterisk in that part of the lecture, which basically says for policy reasons, we're gonna give them a break and we're going to allow some of this loss to actually reduce your ordinary income. Is $3,000 a whole lot? No, no, it's really not. So why 3,000? Eh, don't have enough time and I'm sure you don't care at this point. So any remaining loss that happens after you've done this ordinary income offset rule will be carried over to the next year retaining its character whether short-term or long-term. Okay, so once you've labeled every single gain or loss, what happens then? And remember, you only label as a short-term capital loss or a long-term capital loss the losses that you're allowed to use. For example, if you were to sell your principal residence, do you get to take that loss? Well, here, let's look at that because that's probably the most obvious example. Would you be able to somehow or another deduct the cost of your loss on your house? And the answer is no, 
you don't have as a principal purpose behind the acquisition of your house the making of a profit. So this was not a transaction entered into for the purpose of profit, so losses from it are not deductible. So then you would not be able to actually deduct the costs or the, the losses that are associated with the sale of your principal residence. And yes, that is a bit weird because you may be required to include the gains from it if it would um, be in excess of what your um, 121 exclusion would be or if you didn't qualify for a principal residence exclusion. But remember, that's because we've got a different idea between when income is included, because we have a comprehensive definition of income, i.e. everything goes in, but we're very stingy and miserly with what deductions we are able to give out. So we dole them out very, very sparingly. And losses are one of those, it's a deduction, so it's handed out very sparingly. So there is a bit of a disjunct there. So once you've labeled every gain or loss, and again, only the ones that you have to, um, that you're allowed to use, then you sort them into short-term and long-term. So I like to think of it as mentally, I move the short-term to one side, I move the long-term to another, and then you net them off. Again, we discussed this in class. And you're gonna end up with either a short-term capital gain or a short-term capital loss that's netted. So a net short-term capital gain or loss on the one side, and on the other, you're gonna end up with either a net long-term capital gain or a net long-term capital loss. You will not have both on each side. You're gonna have one or the other because you either come out with a gain or a loss within each of the two categories. So once you've determined your nets, your net short-term gain or your net short-term loss, and then your net long-term gain or your net long-term loss, you apply the formula from um, you from 1222.11 to determine if there's a net capital gain. And remember the formula they give is a net long-term capital, net capital, net capital gain is equal to a net long-term capital gain minus net short-term capital loss. And we discussed this very briefly, but I want to make sure that you understand what happens if you don't have a net short-term capital loss, but you actually have a net short-term capital gain, then the, there is no loss. So that part of the formula is a zero, okay? And if that is the case, then of course your net capital gain is gonna be equal to your net long-term capital gain because there is nothing to subtract from it. So if you end up with a net capital gain, then you know that 1H is going to apply, so you head over to 1H. Okay, so one of the weird things about the way this is drafted, and by this I mean 1H itself, is the fact that even though we just came from defining net capital gain in 1222.11, as soon as we hit 1H, we immediately have to do a detour because 1H11 tells us that for purposes of 1H, i.e. the subsection, qualified dividend income has to be included into net capital gain. So qualified dividend income, it's defined in 1H11 and it gives you some uh, specific requirements and we discussed those in class. There's also a holding period, which is basically 60 days. Uh, you have to have it at least 60 days, I think over 60 days for a capital, for a share that is from common shares. And I think it's over 90 days if it's a preferred share. But either way, qualified dividend income has to be added into net capital gain. So usually how I like to describe this is that net capital gain gets you into 1H, but as soon as you get in 1H, you kind of reconstitute your group for the party. Okay, so you add in your qualified dividend income, and then you basically sort again. Now, unlike sorting into long-term and short-term, we're actually gonna short, we're gonna sort within long-term. Okay, and in the next slide, I'm gonna show you a chart, which is generally how I do it where we're sorting it into 28% rate gain, which is from collectibles. Um, and collectibles are basically the things that you see in 408M, section 408M. There's the 25% rate gain category, and then there's the 0, 15, 20 rate gain category, which is going to be our adjusted net capital gain. You'll notice that the 0, 15, 20, the adjusted net capital gain, 
by the way this is actually set up, it is the residual category. So once you've sorted them into here's 28%, here's 25%, and here's the rest of it, then you have to take out qualified dividend income again. Why? Because you have to actually apply the losses. You've already taken the losses, remember? Why? Because when you look at your definition of net capital gain, it is net of your losses. But what we're doing here isn't testing whether we can use them or not, it's how we distribute them. Because there is a different rate structure within section 1H for these different types of long-term capital gains. So, when we're applying the losses within each category, it's a good thing to actually set them out like this. For example, if I had a collectible that I had you know, um, $100 worth of gain on and I had $50 worth of loss on a different collectible, I would generally fill it out like this. Now, 25% rate category for our purposes is basically unrecaptured depreciation. If you were to buy property for $100 and you were able to take depreciation deductions over a, say, let's say a 10 year period, you take $40 worth of depreciation deductions. You know that because of 1016, your basis is going to adjust for those depreciation deductions. So I just said $40. So you bought it for $100, you took $40 worth of depreciation deductions. That would generally mean that your, <clears throat> excuse me, your basis should be $60. But let's say you turn around and sell the land, the property, for $100 you've now got a loss because your basis, your adjusted basis is $60, you sell it for $100, so suddenly we've got this loss on paper when you and I both know that they, there was not really a market loss that happened there. So basically section 1250 rate gain, which is the 25% rate category, is the loss that's created by a basis adjustment from depreciation. And to the extent that the gain is because of this basis adjustment, that's what goes into this category. The example I just gave you where I buy the land for or the property for $100, I take depreciation deduction of $40, so my new adjusted basis is $60, and then I sell it for $120. Well, 40 of the gain is due to um, these depreciation deductions, so the $40 would go here, and the other, what did I say, $120? The other $20 is actually going to be um, 0, 15, 20 rate gain. So you can bifurcate a gain like that. So I would put the gain right there, and generally you don't have losses stemming from 25% rate category stuff, because that's just crazy talk. And then whatever's left over of your net capital gain goes into the residual. So let's say here that you had $200 of gain in this category, the residual category that isn't one of these two. And you have, say, $25 of loss. And let's say for short-term purposes, you have $50 of gain and $20 of loss. So... In order to actually know how much you actually have within each category, you do apply the losses. And the losses that get applied are first within the category. So $50 of loss, $100 of gain, that would mean that my actual, what is in my 28% rate category is a $50 gain. My 25% rate category is 40 because I didn't have anything to net it with. And this one, what is happening in this rate category is I would have $175 of gain. And for my short term, I would have $30 of gain. So you actually do that kind of application. You apply like to like, which means within the same category. Um, and when you look at what's left, if you were to have excess loss that wipes out. So let's say that this was you know, $100 of loss. Well, that would wipe out this 50, you see? And you would still have $50 worth of loss in this category. Well, then I would take that 50 and I would put it in the highest rate category, which is the 28% rate, and that would wipe out the rest of the gain here.
So that would leave us with just a $40 um, gain in 25% rate category and 175 in the adjusted net capital gain. So when we're looking at it, we need to know where the losses go in order to know how much we have in each category. Why does it matter? Because at the end of the day, this is the adjusted net capital gain category is our super preference. So we need to know how much is in that category. And how do we know that? By applying the losses. In a way, this is a tax, um, a f actually preferential for taxpayers because once you eradicate what's in your category, so let's say that you know you eradicate all of your short-term, short-term always gets applied first. When you erase all of these gains with losses here, then it goes up to the highest rate category and works its way down. So you would eliminate all of your 28% rate category stuff before you would reduce what's in the lower taxed bracket here. Okay. So, like I said here, short-term losses get applied first, then whatever's left over, would you would climb up to the top and just ladder down. After you've applied the losses, then and only then do you add back in the qualified dividend income. Remember I said that it's very strange drafting? Well, this strange drafting essentially tells us that we have to put the qualified dividend income into our net capital gain as soon as we hit 1H, but as soon as we do what we want to do in 1H, we have to pull it out in order to apply the losses. Then when we've applied all the losses, then and only then do we add this qualified dividend income back into the adjusted net capital gain category. The reason for this is that although net capital gain is drafted to include QDI, it actually is not a capital gain. So it's going to be taxed like it's a capital gain, but it isn't a capital gain, which means that we don't want it to be available to soak up any capital losses. So this is a way of making sure that it doesn't soak up losses. So if you were to have um, basically more losses than gains in all of the other categories, and you would have a carry forward of a net capital loss to future years, this ensures that your qualified dividend income is still going to be in your adjusted net capital gain. So you would still have a net capital gain in that situation. So there is the possibility of having a loss carry forward as well as actually having a net capital gain in that specific situation. So at this point, you should know what's in each category because you've applied the losses within the categories and from the other categories, which tells us that you know how much is 28% rate gain, you know how much is 25% rate gain, and you know how much is adjusted net capital gain. Um, you also, by the way, should know what the taxpayer's total income is um, because that's going to be important. Why? Well, the adjusted net capital gain rate, the 0, 15, 20 that you see here, that depends on what the taxpayer's income is. Allow me to explain. The adjusted net capital gain has three potential rates. These are potential rates, uh, progressive rates specifically set up for adjusted net capital gain. The brackets used to be tied to what our ordinary income brackets are, but because of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and the drafting, you know how I feel about that, this is because it did not remember to tie in the capital gains rate to the new rate brackets. So the old rate brackets are what determines the capital gains rates for adjusted net capital gain. Yeah, that's, that's fun. But in a way, it makes it easy for you because it did often confuse people. So I can tell you that adjusted net capital gains taxation has completely different rate brackets than ordinary income. But remember that the starting point for determining where your adjusted net capital gain gets taxed depends on the taxpayer's other income. So basically their total income, which includes 28% rate gain, it includes 25% rate gain, it includes everything else but adjusted net capital gain. And their salary, et cetera, et cetera, business income, everything else, their total taxable income you only take out the adjusted net capital gain, 
and you see where that puts you on this chart. And again, remember that your um, particular circumstances determine whether you're what your rate brackets are, whether you're single, married, filing jointly, head of household. Obviously, there's another couple of categories, but you get the gist. So let's say that you're single. If you are with your ordinary income, your regular income, everything else puts you at, what I say, $37,000. And then your taxable, that's your taxable income. And then you've got 10,000 of adjusted net capital gain. What that means, you see that this is the rate bracket we're looking at right here, right? That means that you haven't filled up the 0% rate bracket. Why? Because the 0% goes to 38.6. So the rest of the bracket that you haven't filled up, which is $1,600, is going to be taxed at a 0% rate. Remember, we've got 10,000 of adjusted net capital gain. So it fills up the rest of that category, which means 1,600 is 0%. Then that leaves us with $8,400 of adjusted net capital gain, which puts us into the next rate bracket here. So that means that the rest of it is going to be taxed at 15%, so that $8,400. If the taxpayer had $500,000 of taxable income, which by the way would work whether you're single, married, filing jointly, or head of household, you were going to have the entirety of your adjusted net capital gain being taxed at the 20% rate category. So that's how these progressive rate structures happen. The starting point is where the finishing point is for your, or the, your other income. So wherever that puts you in these three whole brackets, the 0, 15, or 20, depending on the taxpayer's circumstances, that is your starting point. If you are single and your ordinary income puts you into $40,000, we can tell you right there that the 0% rate bracket is completely, utterly irrelevant because your ordinary income puts you outside of that bracket to start with. Okay, so that's basically capital gains taxation in a nutshell. What you need to do is to map out the steps that you need to take and basically make yourself an analytical decision tree similar to what we did for gains derived from dealings and property. You know, it's, it's not super complicated, but each and every step has to be done in a specific order in order for your analysis to be sound. Um, the reason that I made this video in lieu of trying to cram everything into the final class was so that we could have a review. And I'm sure that because we're having classes canceled for today, that everyone and their dog is gonna be basically struggling to try to figure out a time to do a makeup class so I figured this was probably easier for most of you but we are still going to have a review session next class okay I hope to see you then take care